brothers and sisters, for the Sutra session, uh, for the Q&A, there's a mic here you can use. Or if you just raise your hands, I'll pass you the mic. Okay. Because it's recorded, you need to go through mic. Dear Venerable, this would ask, uh, do we need to have some basic understanding of Dharma and Sutta before we practice uh, meditation or, or for some people, or can we just go straight to meditations and then come back to listening uh, you know, Dharma? Which one do you think is better? Thank you. Uh, okay, well, it, it, it goes together, right? It goes together. So often you, you do a little bit of both. Find your way, right way, and with these things. Um, the, I think it's always good to have a little bit of understanding, and, and sometimes, okay, great, thank you. Uh, because um, the, the problem is that there are many different ways of meditating, right? If, if you go to, if you go to Christ, the Christians, they will teach you meditation, and, and, you know, anybody can teach you meditation, but it has to be in a system whereby it gives certain results. So, uh, and, and sometimes, if you have no understanding of Buddhism, you don't know what you're doing. You kind of, you know, you kind of everything is out of the, you know, you have no idea what's actually happening, what it's all about, what the, what, what the purpose of all of this is. So I think it's good to have a little bit of understanding. And, uh, but sometimes you don't have to go to the sutta straight away. Sometimes you can go to another teacher, uh, you know, somebody who you think is trustworthy and reliable because they have a good character or whatever. And then, and then later on, if you're interested, you can read a bit of the sutta or something. So. So it's not, ideally it's good to go back to the suttas because they are the standard by which everything else needs to be measured, right? Otherwise you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. So it's good to come back to them, but you know, you don't actually have to start there if you, don't, if you don't want to. Sometimes people get a bit dispirited, they really don't really understand what's going on, they find it too hard or too difficult. And if you do, what I, what I recommend people, if you get like the magic money card, you don't understand what sutta, skip it, go to the next one, right? Give that, skip the next one, and even if you only one sutta in the whole Majjhimanikaya, that's already already quite good. Right? Because it gives you some basic you know, idea of what the Dharma is about. Uh, so there isn't really any absolute right or absolute wrong in these things. Uh, uh, but to anyone who is serious about Buddhist practice, uh, I would recommend eventually to, to read some suttas as well. Uh, yeah. Do you understand what I'm talking about here, generally speaking? Do you find it? Yeah, yeah, good, okay. <laughs> Great, yeah. Okay, excellent, yeah. Good, because uh, yeah. if you don't understand what's going on, please, you know, just say so. You don't understand? <laughs> That's perfectly okay, because it, the whole point of this is to kind of bring across some uh, understanding, yeah. Um, there was a question over here about, I, I can repeat the question actually, yeah, uh, obvious one. Um, there was a question about, uh, I mentioned very briefly about the three words uh, uh, Padana, Bayama, and Virya, uh, and, uh, the, and you were asking about what, basically what, what was I talking about, right? What was that all about? Uh, and all I was saying is that uh, Padana is one of the factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, Samma, Padana, Right Effort, also called Samma, Bayama, also Right Effort. And that factor of the Noble Eightfold Path is uh, a large part of that is how you apply yourself, right? You apply yourself, you make an effort. So you, you try, right? You say, okay, I'm going to take the five precepts. So you make an effort to actually uh, be able to apply yourself to keep those five precepts. Now, virya is more like the energy, natural energy in the mind. You don't actually have to apply yourself, uh, right? Sometimes to, to have energy, you need to apply yourself uh, to create that energy. But sometimes when your meditation is going well, your defilements are being abandoned, there's a natural energy inside of you. You feel energized. It's like when you wake up in the morning after a good night's rest, and you feel energy, right? It's a natural energy. And at the end of the day, you feel tired because you've been uh, waste using all that energy for, for the day. So the difference is, one is applying yourself uh, by trying, not necessarily having energy inside. The other one is a natural energy, uh, where just energy is there. Uh, and you can uh, apply that energy according to your desire. So, you see the difference? So, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. So the idea is that you know when you get to the natural energy, it's much more powerful, right? It's, everything becomes very easy because you don't have to exert the will anymore. It just comes by itself. So even in deep meditation, not doing anything, just sitting there. 
but actually you feel very energetic. Okay. Okay, so let's have a look at these questions. Um, okay. Question number one, what is the difference between the concentrated mind and the still mind? Okay, so they, they, these two things are really just different translations of the same word. Right? The word in Pali is samadhi, or samma samadhi, and some people translate it as concentrated, but some people say maybe still or something else is a better translation. And many different, any, you know, a term like samadhi doesn't really have any natural translation into English, right? We don't, we don't talk about, there's no people in England or, you know, English-speaking countries that didn't do, didn't sit down and do meditation practice. So because they didn't do that, you know, there's no word in English for this kind of thing. So we have to come up with a term which is roughly equivalent to. And uh, uh, Venerable Bhikkhubodhi, he uses concentrated uh, because the idea is that the mind gets unified, right? It's like it, the mind kind of gets unified at one point. Uh, and from that perspective, there is a, a sentence in which concentration is right. Uh, but the way that we normally use the word concentrated in the English language is that we are applying ourselves, applying the mind. I am concentrating, right? Uh, and if you concentrate a lot hard, if you're very tired after a while, because you're forcing yourself, oh, I've got to study hard, I've got to work hard, I've got to do all this boring stuff I don't really want to do, right? But I, I still, I, I have to force myself. And when you come back after a long day of forcing your mind in that way, what we call concentration, you feel tired. But that is not the kind of concentration we mean in Buddhism. That is not what samadhi means. Samadhi doesn't mean forcing your mind onto something. And that is why it is perhaps an unfortunate translation because it gives you the wrong idea of how to go about practicing meditation practice. Yeah. So that is why, as Ram says, concentration is not good, it should be used concentration with different translation. And that's why he used, used the word stilled or stillness to translate samadhi. Samadhi is stillness. It's not that samadhi actually means stillness, but it's one of the qualities of samadhi is stillness. The word samadhi itself is very hard to pin down the meaning, yeah? but one of the qualities of samadhi is stillness. That is why uh, you can use that as, as a translation. Yeah? Uh, there are many other possible translations as well, and, um, but uh, yeah, I think that is quite, quite a good one. So you have to be careful because by translating, we are giving a feeling for this word. If you give the wrong feeling, people start practicing in the wrong way, right? And so you force your mind. You have to watch the breath, right? You know what it's like, you have to watch the breath, but you force your mind onto the breath. And after a while, oh, headache, can't take it anymore. <laughs> you, know, you know what it's like, yeah, it's terrible, right? And this is how it goes with uh, if you practice in the wrong way. Yeah. So these things matter. Okay, second question. How do lay people like us who have limited knowledge of meditation practice uh, uh, and apply the suttas, apply these suttas, because it is very heavy for us to understand. <laughs> okay, it is not that hard to understand, you know, it's fairly, if it is heavy, it is my fault, if I'm doing a bad teacher, it is heavy for one to understand, it. so I have to kind of sharpen up my act. You will understand more by the end of this course, and the reason you will understand more is that many of these things are basically about the same, it's about the same things again and again, from different angles. So, so what this really is all about, it is all about how to deal with the mind, how to learn to think in the right way. This is what this is about, right? So learning how to move from having less ill will to having more metta, having less, being less ruthless, right? Uh, to being more compassionate, uh, having more, uh, basically moving towards good qualities of mind. This is what this is all about. Uh, I have not really included in the suttas about the ordinary virtue of body and speech. We can talk about that as well because it's very, very beautifully explained in the suttas. And I talked about that last time I was here in KL. So I thought this time I'll pick different suttas, otherwise those people come again, they kind of, they might get bored or whatever. And perhaps that is over, uh, being, maybe being a bit over the top because sometimes it's good to get things repeated. Huh? But, um, uh, the main thing in the Buddhist practice, remember, it is all about kindness, right? The 
whole aspect of virtue or sila in Buddhism can be summarized in that word to be kind and to be kind in how you speak, to be kind in how you act and also to be kind in how you think. This is, this is really what it's all about and if you do that, if you remember that, then you will always be heading in the right direction. But it's quite hard to always be kind. Right? So often we get challenged. Often there are difficult people around us. You don't want to be kind if somebody is difficult, right? Mm -hmm. It's just natural, very hard to be kind. If somebody, you feel somebody is nasty to you, how can you be kind back? But this is where the challenge of the practice is, right? It's to understand, well, if it is too difficult, then pull back a little bit and then think about the situation in a different way. This is what I mean by using your wisdom power, using your ability to reflect think about it differently. And when you see that person from a different perspective, actually it is possible to be kind even though that person is bad, right? <laughs> even though they are stupid and they're saying silly things because you start to understand actually it's not about me, right? It's not because it's not about you. you we feel that it's about us. We feel it's personal. They are doing something bad to us and that is the problem. When you feel it's personal, you take it personally, that's when you get upset. But actually, if the other person does something stupid or something bad, it's their problem. It's not your problem. They are just following their own conditioning inside. They are acting out their own problems to the external world. They are the ones who have a problem. Once you understand it's got nothing to do with you, has everything to do with the other person, it changes, the, it turns the table. And suddenly, you see that compassion is actually the right response to that kind of situation. Why? Because the other person is deluded. They are stupid. They don't understand what is in their best interest. If you don't understand what is in your best interest and you act in a way which in the long run leads to your own suffering, well, you have to feel sorry for them, right? They're causing suffering for themselves, for goodness sake. Nobody wants that. We all want to be happy. If you understand that other people are causing suffering for themselves, then you have compassion instead. And you're able to deal with that. They are dealing with their own demons. So this is how you, this is what I mean by learning how to think wisely. And, and then from that comes the wise action, the wise speech, right? And then everything else happens as a consequence. So sometimes people ask, should we, what, what, is, what should be the priority in Buddhist practice? Should priority be to be kind and to be good and practice sila, or is meditation more important? What is the most important thing? And the most important thing in Buddhist practice is to be kind. That is number one. That is the foundation stone. Everything else is based on that. If you are going to meditate, then use your meditation to support your kindness, to support your sila. Then you are using it in the right way. And then when you go on retreat, sometimes you may have some nice meditations as a consequence. But sila is number one. That should be number one priority. So if you're going to meditate a little bit every day, do it so you support your sila. Do some metta practice. So just do a little bit of uh, stillness so you can relax, you can feel better about yourself. So then you have more time for people afterwards. So, right? Uh, simple things. Uh, be kind, be compassionate, be generous. Uh, always ask yourself, what is it? How can I be kind to other people? How can I make them feel good? I was recently uh, in Thailand about a couple, three, four, a couple of weeks ago, something like that, and I went to visit a very famous monk in Thailand called Ajahn Ganhan. Have you heard about Ajahn Ganhan? <coughs> a famous monk in Thailand, yeah. <coughs> and uh, very nice. Have you, have you visited him? Visited him? Or? No. Okay. He's very, very. When you come to visit Ajahn Ganha, it's like you. You know, you feel really relaxed, you feel really at ease, because there's so much kindness, so there's so much peace, the feeling of metta and compassion is so strong. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I, I asked him, you know, how do you, you know, he, he obviously has a lot of metta, I said, how do you practice metta? Right? And he said, this is how you practice metta. I think, oh, you're, okay, I thought he would say, oh, you sit down, you cross your legs, you say, oh, may all beings be happy, right? He said nothing like that at all. What, what he said was that every day when you wake up, you should ask yourself, what can I do today to be of help and to be of kindness to the people and the world around me? That is how you should practice metta. Every day when you wake up, what can I do today to be kind and helpful to the people and the world around me? 
Very simple, right? But this is how you practice metta. Huh? So you are kind to other people. It's a very practical thing. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it in meditation practice. And we should as well. But the basis, the foundation is laid in how we practice it in daily life. Huh? It's very, very, very beautiful. Huh? And uh, I sometimes like to think, when I think about these things, I often think, uh, well, whenever I open my mouth, uh, I want what I say to be a gift to other people. Huh? How can I make it a gift to other people? Sometimes, if I feel in a bad mood, I say, okay, don't talk, just shut up. <laughs> because whatever comes out is not going to be very nice, right? You can kind of feel it inside of yourself. But at other times, you know, when you feel inspired to say something, that's always say something. And other people, they will feel good and happy when they hear it. They will feel good. Not flatter them in a bad way, anything like that, but there's something which goes to people's hearts, right? Good morning, nice to see you today, and how are you? Just something kind, something nice, right? And then actually you feel that, you know what it's like when other people treat you with kindness? You feel uplifted, you feel good. And in the same way, you can give a gift to other people every time you open your mouth. You can give a gift or you can give them something bad, which they feel bad about. That is your choice. So if you're able to do that, think like that. Every time you act, how can I act in such a way that my every action is a gift to other people, so they feel uplifted rather than trodden down. Simple ways of thinking, and this way you are really enhancing your practice and moving in the right direction. And, uh, yeah. Okay, so, I, I apologize that it is so heavy to understand. I really, <laughs> I try my best. I. Yeah, so this, you know, when you when you read the suttas, it can be a bit difficult because you're not used to the way of thinking that's in there. But I, I promise you that actually it is not that hard to understand. It actually is once you start to get the feel for what the suttas are about, they're actually very beautiful. Huh? They're very direct about how to apply ourselves, how to live the life. And once you start to get into that, you think, wow, actually this is so nourishing huh? and it's so helpful in my practice. Then you're heading in the right direction. Huh? Okay, so, uh, next one. Dear Ajahn Ramani, since regret is naturally human, is guilt similar to regret? How does one eliminate guilt from one's conscience? Uh, yes, guilt is kind of similar to regret. Guilt is maybe, maybe a little bit more. Guilt is often the fear that you deserve punishment, right? If you are guilty, it means you deserve to be punished. Because that's what we say, if you go to the court and you, okay, you are guilty, next thing is prison, right? Or whatever it is. So you, it's a feeling that I deserve to be punished. That's what guilt is really about. So, um, uh, it is not exactly the same because regret is just this feeling that you feel kind of yucky. You feel, you feel like you did the wrong thing, right? There's a sense that I didn't do what was right. And then you feel kind of bad about yourself, slightly ashamed of your actions, right? If somebody else wants to say say what you did, oh, please don't say it, please be quiet, and don't want this to kind of be spread out, right? This is what it is. You don't, you don't feel proud of what you did, basically. Yeah? That is a sense of shame, a sense of regret about what you're doing. Yeah? So, guilt is really on top of that. Yeah? So how do you eliminate guilt from your conscience? Um, well, basically, it is a similar thing as uh, you know. You uh, you start you uh, you forgive yourself, right? Uh, you learn how to forgive yourself, uh, and one of the most important ways of learning to forgive yourself uh, is to learn that we are all conditioned into what we are. Uh, you are conditioned into the person you are. Uh, where do, why, why do we have the habits that we have? Why do we have the personalities that we have? Is it because you choose to have that personality or habit? Well, the vast majority of it is just because what you have been conditioned to be according to all the conditions that have worked on you in this life and also conditions that come from past lives as well. All of these things have created the being, the person you are in this life. It's very, 
it's very powerful. The more you can see that, that you're acting out your, you know, your, your conditioning, the more you understand that, yeah? and the easier it is to forgive yourself because you know it wasn't really me choosing to do bad things. It was just the conditioning that was playing itself out. Yeah? It's like me when I, you know, if I like Norwegian food, right? And if you if you saw some of the Norwegian food I like, you would say, "What? Well, you can't eat that. It must be serious. That looks terrible." <laughs> You know, things like pickled herring. Does pickled herring sound nice to you? And you probably, if you saw it, you probably, you know, probably think I would be crazy to eat something. We have something in Norwegian, Norway, some kind of fish that they put in an alkaline solution. So when you uh, cook it, it's transparent, completely transparent fish, right? It looks like jelly or something. It's something that we only have in Norway. I haven't seen it anywhere else in the whole world. It looks a bit like jelly. It looks really disgusting. Uh, and when you eat, it doesn't taste like anything. But I find it delicious, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful. So why is that? Uh, well, you know, when the I remember when the, the Western monks, when they first went to Thailand, I, I didn't actually start out in Thailand, but Ajahn Brahm started out in Thailand. He talks about the food they had there, right? Uh, and the food, they would eat everything. They would eat ants, eggs, and all kinds of insects, and all kinds of all kind of stuff. Uh, but in the you know in Europe, you know, used to eating insects or insects is considered disgusting. Yeah? So it's really hard. Okay, you eat the rice and then maybe you kind of close your eyes and then you eat some of the other stuff. Yeah? That's how difficult it is. Yeah? But it's all conditioning, right? Yeah? So and this is this is what it's all about. And one of the most powerful stories that I, I heard about the, uh, the power of conditioning here. Yeah? Uh, was a person in uh, uh, Australia, he was a member of the Buddhist society down there, and he did a past life regression. Uh, and during this past life regression, he remembered the past life, right, with lots of details, lots of things. Often past life regression is very unreliable, you know, you, you think that, you you know, you always hear the stories of people being king so-and-so, queen so-and-so, <laughs> straight away you can just dismiss it, right? Uh, but not that many queens, they're always, you know, they're not everybody is a queen or a king in the past life. Right? <laughs> so, if you, if you were just very ordinary person, right, toiling in the rice field, oh, you know, oh, everything, oh, so much dukkha, life is so terrible, being just an ordinary person, then maybe you can rely on the past life. <laughs> That's, we, most of us were like that, right? We're just ordinary people, for goodness sake. Anyway, we don't want to hear that though, it's too... So he's, he said that he remembered all these details. He remembered who he was, he remembered that he had been an immigrant from Ireland. He was very poor, right? And he wanted to escape from Ireland. Ireland was a very poor country in the middle of the 19th century. That's why there's so many Irish immigrants around the world. You go to the US, everybody, you know, five million Irish immigrants go to Australia. Similar kind of things because it was so terrible to be there. And all kind of famines and mistreated by the British, like, every, like the British did a lot of damage around the world, and including in Ireland as well. <laughs> anyway, so he, he, he had this memory, right, of being this poor man escaping from Ireland. He remembered his name, coming to Australia, joining the army. He could, in this recollection, he could see the boots. He was wearing army boots. He could see the bottom of his trousers and jackets. So he was clearly a soldier. Uh, he got married at some stage, he remembered the name of his wife, he remembered the kids that he had, he remembered the, what the house he lived in, what it looked like, right? So he could, and, and roughly where it was, he remembered building up this farm, and all of these things, right? And he remember when he died, he was very proud of having kind of made something out of such humble beginnings, but having building up something very good. He felt very proud of that. And uh, then he, you know, wow, what an amazing memory. And at the beginning, he wouldn't have anything of that. Uh, he wouldn't believe it because he was raised as a Catholic, even though he was now going to the Buddhist temple. He was raised as a Catholic. Rebirth is nonsense, right? Don't have anything to do with rebirth. So he was shocked by this memory. But then he realized because he had so much information, it was actually possible to go into the registries and look, did such a person actually exist? And then he started to check it out. He had his own name, right? The name of his wife, his occupation, all of these things. And of course, now they started to check out, right? Check, check, one after the other. And I think something like 95% of the things he remembered actually turned out to be correct. It took him months of research to find these things out. He had to travel down to the southwest of Western Australia to find the old farm where he had lived, right? Recognizing the house, there was a 
there was all these all this things that he had to do to find these things out. Uh, and gradually, over the months, he said he had no choice but to believe that there was such a thing as rebirth. There were just too many things uh, to be coincidence that checked out uh, the memory and the actual reality. There was too many things checking out. Uh, so he felt that he had, as a consequence, to believe in rebirth. I don't know. I'm not, you know, to be able to really decide, you would have to do some kind of statistical analysis to see the likelihood of all these things, right? And make it very complicated. And, but for him, it was very, very powerful, right? But for, if you are, if you are a non-believer, you have to be very kind of scientific about this. It's not enough to say that like, it feels right to me. You have to have more. But for him, it was very powerful. And what he, what he said, the most interesting thing of all of this. Uh, it wasn't the fact that he had to believe in rebirth, but the most interesting thing was uh, that one of the things that he realized was how he was carrying across the habits from the past, uh, how he was carrying that from the past life into the present life. Uh, in this life, he's a very successful businessman. He's selling some kind of IT or something to the mines, everything in Western Australia is about mining, right, all of mining state. Uh, and so, so he was building up this business and doing very well and feeling very Proud, right? I've worked very hard and built up this business, and now he was going to sell it for some few million dollars or whatever, and he would have his whole life would have been made as a consequence. But then he realized, actually, it's not me having this desire to work hard. It's not coming from me. It's coming from a past life. I was exactly the same person in the past life. I was a farmer building up this farm from nothing. This has always been part of me, right? And then he started to feel, this is terrible, man. it's not coming from me, this is like scary, I'm running on a program, I'm like a robot, I'm a robot, right? And of course, if that program for that robot, he doesn't know whether it was written in that past life, probably it was written long, long time before that. This program written in the ancient past, and you're still running on that same program, whoa, scary, very scary. And this is, um, so this is the kind of thing that, uh, you know, kind of, uh, this is the sort of thing that uh, makes, you, makes you change your attitude in life. It starts, starts to kind of make you look at things in a different way. You're seeing the dangers of, of, of these things. Uh, and you're seeing that you're heading uh, in, the, in the wrong direction. And you're starting to understand how incredibly conditioned we are. We are so conditioned. We have no idea how conditioned we are. Uh, it feels in this life like you are taking charge of your life, right? You are choosing to marry this person, right? You are choosing this job. No, perhaps you're not. Perhaps you're running on this program for the past, right? You have been married to the same person a hundred lifetimes before. And you'll probably get married again in the next life. So, so. And this, once you start to understand that, it becomes like a burden, it becomes terrible, it becomes scary, and you start to look at things different. But the main point for the, for the purpose of this question is that we are incredibly conditioned. We, what we are as human beings is the sum total of all the conditions that have worked on us internally and externally back for infinite lives back in the past. That's who we are. And once you understand that, you can forgive almost anything. You know that the reason why you're doing it, the reason why you're arguing with your wife or your husband, is not because you are bad, it's because you've been doing it for a thousand lifetimes. That's why you're doing it. <laughs> exactly. Right? And if you don't do anything about it now, you're going to do it for the next thousand lives as well. This is your opportunity to change this. Thing. And this is what you feel. So he said that what he wanted to do as soon as he saw that he was actually just running on the same thing that he was doing in the past time, he wanted to throw out that job. He got this aversion, right? I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to be a robot. I want to take charge of my own life. I want to throw out the whole thing. And he wanted to, basically he, he thought about becoming a monk at that time. But he, was already, he was already married and all this kind of stuff, so it was very difficult. But this shows you the correct way of reflecting about past life. Why the idea of past life is so powerful if you think about it in the right way. But it's all about doing it in the right way. It's not just saying, yeah, yeah, I believe in past life. That's nothing. You have to think about it in the right way. So it really has a powerful emotional impact. Then it becomes very powerful. Then it becomes very useful. And then you can forgive yourself. You
can forgive the guilt, you can forgive the bad conscience, and if you, can, you can forgive all those things, at least to a very large degree. Not 100%, because there will be always be a little bit inside of us that feels that you are responsible. 100% is impossible, but at least most of it you can let go of. And that is the most important thing here. Okay. So, let's move on to the next one. Everybody happy with that? If you want to kind of follow up question, that's fine. You can do that as well. Okay. Dear Ajahn, um, we love our children. Wonderful. That's, I'm very happy to hear that. That's a question. I hate your children, so it's good. Yeah. Yeah. Both boys aged uh, 18 and 15, and we often worried about them. Each is sleeping late or eating too much, unhealthy food, etc. We often nag them, and very often they get upset ourselves. What can we do, and is this a too much attachment? Okay, so uh, remember that this is life, right? People at that age, they sleep late, that's what they do. So don't expect them to be miracle children that are different from all other children. It's very funny, I don't know if you have seen the cartoons around, there's one kind of famous cartoon called Zitz, have you ever heard Malaysia? It's an American cartoon called Zitz, it's about this young guy, he's 15 years old, right? And when you read it, you will recognize your own children straight away, They're exactly like that. All children are exactly the same. You know, he wakes up at 3pm, 3, 3 right? He kind of staggers out of bed, and I'm sure your child probably gets up before 3pm, and still, right? So, this shows what it's like, and all of these character traits that children have, I was exactly the same. What, what, what were you like when you were young? You probably have some of that as well, right? Sometimes we forget what we were, what we were like when we were younger. So, don't expect too much. Expect them to do what young people do. Allow them sometimes to do bad things or the wrong thing. Sometimes it's important that children are allowed to experiment and learn from their own mistakes. They cannot just learn from what we tell them. Sometimes they have to learn in practice how the world works. Sometimes they're going to make mistakes. Okay, fine, make mistakes. And then you forgive them afterwards. So I think this is the most important thing that we can do for our children is to love them unconditionally. Right? Understand that they will not be perfect. Remember, your child too is running on a program that was written in the past life, right? So they don't have that much control. They have probably been sleeping in for the past thousand lives. Still going to be sleeping in, right? This is, this is the way it goes. So allow that. Give them unconditional love. Show them you really care for them. What you really are concerned about is their happiness. And sometimes you can nudge them a little bit in the right direction. The most important thing is just to love them for who they are yeah. because you can only do so much. And I think often what happens, if you give people freedom, they tend to rise to the occasion. Yeah. They tend to actually do the right thing. Yeah. That is my experience. Yeah. Ajahn Brahm is like that. He's completely uncontrolled and right. You can make all the mistakes you, can, you want to and all he will say is very good. That's all he will ever say. <laughs> Does he say that here in Malaysia as well? Very good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> It says that everywhere, and it means, it means okay, whatever, it doesn't matter, you know, you, you just carry on. And you, after a while, you start to take responsibility for yourself, uh, because you understand that's really the only way. You cannot rely on authorities or other people to lead your life. You have to take responsibility for your own life. Uh, so there's something about being given that freedom. You tend to rise to the occasion, and you start to lead a responsible life. So allow your children to make mistakes, allow them to, to sleep in, allow them to, to, to do whatever. And um, usually, if you have a lot of uh, unconditional love for them, then usually uh, they, will, they will start to head in the right direction. If they, leave, um, if they eat a lot of unhealthy food, um, I, don't, I don't know what you can do about that. Maybe. <laughs> maybe um, Sometimes you have to find nice food, right, that is healthy. And when you find the nice food that is healthy, sometimes they will actually go for it because of that. So you have to kind of do something to make it go in the right way. The most important thing is just to be, uh, to, to be kind, not to expect too much, uh, and to accept them for who they are. And usually that turns out to be the best thing. Yeah. So uh, that is what I have learned from Ajahn Ram, and that is what I have learned from, my, I guess, my own parents to some extent. They weren't very controlling either. Yeah. And usually uh, people turn out in the right way. 
And sometimes it goes wrong, right? Sometimes your children turn out to be criminals or they turn out to be drug addicts or whatever. And, and sometimes you think, okay, well, that's what they, maybe that's what they had to do, right? And so hopefully with your encouragement, they will eventually they will turn out in the right way. But even if they do turn out to be, do the wrong thing, maybe they make a mistake in their life, a big mistake, still make sure you don't turn away from them because of that. Uh, remember, they have just been conditioned to do this. Uh, there's lots of other, other qualities in that child. Look for those other qualities uh, and you can still love them even though they make mistakes. Uh, don't, put any, uh, don't put any conditions on your love. Uh, if you do, that is when the problems start to arise. Uh, Okay, I'm not sure how helpful that is. It's difficult, right? I've never had any children. I don't know anything about this. So, so, um, so uh, yes, good luck. Okay. Dear Ajahn, my father is 88 years old and spends a lot of time watching television programs, but he often falls asleep. Oh, so many old people do just that. They kind of sit down in front of the television, fall asleep, they wake up, watch television again. Fall, you know, this is, uh, this is so common. Uh, it's like he is attached to it and does not uh, want and does not want to do with himself if he is not watching television. Is this attachment? What can be done to help him? Um, I think in this case, if he is 88 years old, I think the best thing is not to try to change him too much. <laughs> you know, what was that? If he's happy. Yeah, I, exactly. I think so. Because when you are 88 years old, you are kind of set, basically you're setting your tracks, right? There's very little you can do with somebody at that age. At that age, your job, if you are you know, the daughter or the son or whatever, is just to give him support. Again, unconditional love is, is the right thing to do. If he wants to watch television, allow him to watch television. Often it can be because he feels lonely, perhaps, if he's living by himself, he needs some kind of company, television is better than nothing. There's all kinds of reasons. Maybe he has some suffering inside and he needs to kind of alleviate that with some kind of, uh, you know, uh, some sort of uh, distraction or whatever. It can be so many reasons. Just allow him to do that. Uh, and instead of a, a, a kind of a blaming your father for doing the wrong thing, try to learn from it. Uh, how can you avoid falling into the same trap in the future? That is perhaps more, more useful. Because that's what often happens, right? We see our parents do this and then we do exactly the same thing. This is, this is the problem. So try instead to learn from that. Why is it happening? Your job, just love your father for who he is, and be kind to him, do the right thing, and, and then that is the best way to encourage him also not to watch television so much. Because if he feels support from his family, support from the people around him, there will be less attachment, less addiction also to the TV. But this is such a common problem, right? This is like everywhere. People are lonely, people watch TV. This is just the way things are in the modern world. And, uh, yeah. So I think, I know traditionally, traditionally the world was full of large families where the grandparents would live at home, right? That, that was what the world used to be like everywhere. Then. And then gradually things are changing. And even in Asia, where kind of family tradition is much stronger, even here, a similar kind of trend seems to be happening again. So uh, try your best to be kind and helpful, and then you're doing your duty as a child. Then. One of the great things about uh, uh, parents uh, is that you can make a lot of good karma by looking after your parents. Uh, one of the amazing things that we find in the suttas, I remember uh, seeing this and I thought, wow, this is really uh, fascinating, very interesting. And I think I mentioned that last time I was here in KL, is that uh, one of the aspects of right view at the very beginning of the Noble Eightfold Path is that there is mother and father. I remember reading that many times, there is a mother and father. I thought, of course there is a mother and father. And I kind of read on, right? I was reading on that. But the point is that if the Buddha says there is a mother and father, it doesn't just mean that you have a mother and father. Of course, of course you have a mother and father. It means that there is something special about mother and father. And if you start to look at how right view is taught, it's all about karma, it's all about rebirth. So what it means is that there is a special karmic potential how you treat your parents, 
Treat your parents badly, and you actually make a lot of bad karma. Treat your parents well, and you can make a lot of good karma. So it is a very powerful feel for marriage. So take that opportunity. Look after your parents in the right way. Don't stress out about it. Don't overdo it so you feel tired and exhausted. Find the right balance. Look after yourself. Look after your parents. But remember, it is a very great potential for making good karma. So be kind to them. Don't just do it out of obligation, right? This is kind of a kind of Confucian ethics, right? Oh, I have to do it, but don't really want to do it. It's too much, right? I have to kind of uh, fill your pipe and all this kind of stuff. But don't do it that way. Don't do it as a pure obligation, because then your heart is not into it. Do it really because you care out of kindness. Then it becomes very powerful. And I have, I have tried to do that with my own parents. And it's very powerful, you know, if you are kind to your parents. This was after I became a monk, of course. Before I was a monk, I was not, not quite like that. <laughs> but, and it is very powerful, because if you treat them kindly, they kind of, what? Right? Oh, this is, this is different. We're not used to this. And then, it changes the entire attitude to so many things in life. When I first ordained as a Buddhist monk, my parents thought, you're crazy. You become a Buddhist monk for you. are well educated. We have looked after you. You have every prospect in the world. You want to go into some kind of cult and become brainwashed by, by something? They have no idea about Buddhism, right? There's no cult, of course. And they thought I was mad. And then, but through your conduct, by simply being kind, by being compassionate, being understanding, by listening to them for once, right? And all these kind of things. After a while, they start to turn around. And now, my parents are virtually Buddhists. <laughs> it's true. They, you know, they listen to my talks online. <laughs> so it, it's, quite, it's very strange when your father says he listens to your talks online. That really kind of catches your attention. Rather than the last person in the world you think will listen to your talks online. <laughs> So it's very, it is a very powerful, and it shows you that kindness works. If you are kind, if you are good, if you do the right thing to people, it has a very powerful effect on people, and they start to change as a consequence. So be kind to your kids if you are a parent. Be kind to your parents if you are a kid. Be kind to your husband if you are a wife. Be kind to your wife if you are a husband, right? And somehow that opens things up. It allows things to blossom in a very beautiful way, and it becomes very powerful. So, um, yes, anyway, I'm not sure where I'm going with all of this. <laughs> That's probably good enough. Uh, yes, I was talking about that, so I pursued uh, about the power of parents, right? Uh, and about the power of right view and, and how this can actually, uh, how important that is. Uh, anyway, so let us uh, move on to the next question. I feel very tired almost all the time. How can I stop using my mind too much? or thinking too much. In meditation, I will feel pain in about 10 minutes and start to fidget about. Is it okay if I only sit for 10 minutes? It is okay. Sit for 10 minutes is fine. It's better than that. As long as you enjoy it, that's the most important thing, right? Five minutes, okay. One minute, okay. So whatever you can do is okay. The most important thing is that you enjoy it and you feel better afterwards. Sometimes I know people, they go to work, and sometimes they just stop and maybe once an hour and just sit quietly for one or two minutes so just to recharge himself a little bit. This is perfectly perfectly okay. Yeah. So then we're feeling tired all the time. Uh, it possibly as you say you are using your mind too much. Uh, so you have to learn just to de-stress, to use your mind less. Uh, and one of the ways of doing that uh, is actually just to practice morality and practice sila. By practicing morality, by being kind to others, uh, you start to feel better about yourself. Uh, when you start to feel better about yourself, it is easier to let go of the mind always thinking. Uh, it's kind of strange, isn't it? That's how it works. Uh, the more happiness you have inside of yourself, uh, because your conduct is good, uh, the less the mind wants to think. Thinking is often a response that because you don't have enough happiness inside. So the mind goes thinking, 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 right? You sit down, can't have a peaceful moment. Why? Because the mind wants to think. It's not finding happiness where it should find happiness, but trying to find happiness in thinking instead. But it doesn't, there's no happiness there. You just get more and more tired until you fall asleep. So if you want to, 
just uh, meditate very short uh, and uh, uh, and just practice all of these things, all the right way of sila, and gradually these things will start to uh, disappear and start to fade away. Uh, and if you can use a meditation just to give you a little bit of a boost of energy, that's also fine, also good enough. Uh, Many, one of the problems with the Buddhist path is that it is very, it, it doesn't really have often uh, immediate results, right? But, well, sometimes it does. Yeah. Sometimes if you use your mind right in the moment, the results are straight away there. Uh, but it is, generally speaking, it's a gradual path. Uh, and very gradually you're shifting your mind, making your mind different, uh, overcoming your old habits and creating new ones. Uh, and because it is gradual, you just have to keep on practicing it. Uh, and when you look back over the months, over the years, and you see that you are changing, and then you feel, wow, it really is working. And so it is a gradual thing. You know, people usually want like magic bullets, right? How can I kind of overcome this straight away? And very often there is no answer to that. There is no straight away thing. You have to keep on doing it, persevering. And this, in my life, I have always felt that those things that you keep doing for a long time, you persevere over a long period of time, those are the things that really are important. Those things that are short-term solutions, kind of magic things that, yeah, we've got the, the really fast path, right? You guys are just practicing the, the long-winded path. I've got a shortcut, right? This is the way to do it. It sounds dubious to me. When I hear the word shortcut, I think, no, I'm not shortcut. Probably more like the long cut, right? <laughs> not the shortcut. And this is usually the case. If something is a shortcut, actually, usually, you don't get there at all. It just takes much longer. So, don't, so often, uh, if something is gradual, but it's steady, improving, 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 usually uh, that, is a very, that is a very good sign. You just have to persevere and practice in the right way. Okay, so, the Venerable, you mentioned that Samadhi is the core, core to insight. I thought one can access insight via vipassana, kindly enlighten Sadhu times three. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if I can enlighten you, but I can maybe do a little bit to in the right direction. So, um, the, uh, uh, the word vipassana uh, in the suttas means something like seeing clearly, that's what it actually means. So you see things clearly, right? So, um, one of the problems is how the word vipassana is used in the present day. Usually it is used about a certain meditation technique, right? You do vipassana meditation, you sit down, you feel all the feelings in the body, and they say, this is vipassana meditation. But really, it's just a word, it's just a name for a particular meditation. You, can, you might as well feeling the feelings in your body, you might as well call it Samatha meditation, right? And usually you're told that Samatha is one meditation, Vipassana is another one. They're kind of different types of meditation. But really, it, when it look, comes to like looking at your feelings in the body, it could be Samatha. If you start to feel peaceful, it's Samatha. If you see things clearly, it is called Vipassana. If you get both, it's both Samatha and Vipassana. <laughs> usually it's both, right? Now the, the point here, and this is one of the things I was talking about also this morning, is this idea that samatha, samatha means calm, vipassana means clear seeing. They are two sides of the same knife. So if you practice in the right way, if you practice the Noble Eightfold Path, these two things, they tend to grow together. If you get clarity of mind through your practice, if vipassana meditation really works, and you get clarity of mind and you see things clearly, you also have samatha. Why? Because they are two sides of the same life. If you get samatha, if you watch your breath and you get peaceful, you also get vipassana, because the calm mind sees it clearly. So why is that? Why is it that these things always have to go together? And the answer is that those things that give rise to samatha, to calm, are exactly the same things that also give rise to vipassana, to clear seeing. It's exactly the same things. What is that? A reduction in the defilements of the mind. 
right? We're just talking about the path here. I've been talking about the different degrees of defilements so, because we want to learn to eliminate the defilements of the mind. And as you do that, Samatha and Vipassana grow together. Now, maybe I should explain this in a little bit more detail because it's good to understand what is going on here. Defilements in the mind, if you have greed, if you have desire, if you are angry, usually greed and desire is about looking into the future, right? If you desire something, it's always about the future. It's about uh, agitation, restlessness, something in the future you want. Uh, if you're angry, it's often about the past. Somebody has hurt you in a bad way. Uh, so in both of these cases, you're not really staying in the present moment. The mind is agitated, the mind is restless because you have desires and you have anger about things. Uh, because of that, defilements are the opposite of calm. If you reduce the anger, you reduce the desire, you feel more calm because you don't have the mind moving into the future, moving into the past, being restless, being agitated. Right? It's fairly obvious. Calm and defilements are the opposite of each other. But defilements and insight or defilements and clear seeing are also the opposite of each other. Because as I was saying before today, if you have a defilement in the mind, if you have a desire, that distorts your outlook. It distorts the way you look at the world. You have a vested interest in the things that you are attached to. You have a vested interest if you're angry in something. And because that, you cannot see clearly if you have desires and you have anger in your mind. So clear seeing is also hindered by defilements. So if you're practicing in the right way, and you're practicing this path which eliminates the defilements that we're talking about here, it is the very nature of the practice of this path that you have to feel more calm and you have to see more clearly. Right? It has to go together. These two things cannot be separated out. So this is what you should focus on. This is why the Buddha focuses on this idea in the Sutta Sin, how to eliminate these defilements. How do we do that? And one way of doing that is to watch your breath. Another way of doing that may be to do what they call vipassana meditation. Perhaps, I don't know, I haven't done any vipassana meditation, or what they call that. But if it works, fine, it doesn't matter. It makes you feel more peaceful, it makes the defilements go down, good, then it's working. But always ask yourself if it works. If it works, you can do anything you like, right? It doesn't matter. There's, not, there's no wrong kind of practice as long as it gives rise to a reduction in the defilements. So, this is really what it comes down to. But when we talk about, uh, when I was talking about samadhi today being the core of insight, I was talking about really deep samadhi, not just vipassana. Remember, vipassana just means clear seeing. There's many, many levels of clear seeing, right? You have a little bit of clear seeing in the beginning. You say, I want to be kind to other people. That's clear seeing, a little bit of clear seeing. After a while, after a while your defilements decrease. You want to be even kinder, that's more clear seeing, right? You start to understand a bit about the permanence, a bit about oneself, even more clear seeing. So there are many, many degrees of vipassana. But the real vipassana, the real insight, is what I call yata buddha nyanadasana, seeing things according to reality. This means deep insight, this means the insight whereby you understand the three characteristics suffering, impermanence, and non-self, right? And you see that in a deep way. That is what can only happen after samadhi. To be able to see things very deeply in a very profound way, that can only happen after samadhi. And that is what that sutta I was reading out this morning said. So, um, I, maybe now you are even more confused than when I started. <laughs> Yes, yes. What's the difference between Vipassana and Vidasana? Because I can understand that in the sutras the word Vidasana appears more than Vipassana. Vidasana. Um, uh, Vidasana, I, that hardly occurs at all in the sutras. Vipassana is actually the usual one. But if it does, it would mean exactly the same thing. Yeah? Because Pasana and Dasana is the same word. Yeah? Just the word which is spelled slightly differently. In Pali, the word pasati means to see, and the word dasati means to see. So it basically would, would mean exactly the same thing. But in the Pali suttas, it is all uh, vipassana. I think maybe you're right. Maybe in some of the Sanskrit suttas, it may be vidasana. I think you may be right about that. Uh, but in the Pali, it's all vipassana. There's no vidasana in the Pali. Yeah. yeah. 
the, the word used in Pali is actually dasana would have to be from just dasana, the same again. Okay, so don't worry too much about the labels, don't worry too much about these things, just make sure that your mind is heading in the right direction, you're getting more clarity, the good qualities are rising, the bad qualities are going down. If that is what's happening in you, wow, you're heading in the right direction. This is what matters, right? And then you feel the path is working. Okay, last question for today. What does direct knowledge mean? Can Bhante further elaborate? Thank you. Okay. Um, direct knowledge means that you are experiencing it directly. You see what's going on, right? There are six direct knowledges, six abhinyas, according to the suttas. And these are the six abhinyas. The most important ones are remembering your past life, right? Direct knowledge, you're actually really remembering it. It's not just some fantasy, but you're actually there. It's as if you're re-experiencing it. The understanding of the arising and passing away of beings. This is like understanding karma to some extent. Second one, third one, destruction of the asavas, becoming, uh, reaching full awakening, becoming an arahant is the third one. The fourth one, uh, read mind reading. Right? Would, be, would you like to read the minds of other people? <laughs> I, I, it was a very interesting, there was a story, I, this is probably not really, really true, I don't know if it's a true story or not, but there was a story of a man in India somewhere who suddenly one day he, he could read other people's minds, right? One day he woke up, maybe he had done this in the past life or something, one day he could just hear the thoughts of other people. Wow, he could hear the thoughts of other people. But then he said that the worst thing, after a while, he wasn't interested anymore. It was just so many bad thoughts, right? Don't want to, don't want to hear all the thoughts. But then he wasn't able to turn it off anymore. He couldn't turn it off. So he was hearing all these thoughts of other people all the time, not being able to turn Imagine the dukkha, right? All these thoughts coming into your mind all the time. So don't think that mind reading is a very good thing. Actually, it's very bad. It's a very bad thing. So, and, um, yeah, anyway. So, mind reading. And then you have the divine ear, right? You can hear sounds far away. You can kind of listen in when the, you know, when somebody is saying some, some secret or something far away. You can listen into that secret conversation or whatever. You can hear the uh, hear the sounds in other realms, like the Deva or whatever. And then the last one is the is kind of the coolest one. That's all the kind of the supernormal powers, right? Flying through the air and diving into the earth and walking on water and and uh, all of this kind of stuff, multiplying yourself into a thousand people, right? Uh, that'd be nice, right? You can protect, you know, if you want to, you have to go to a meeting, something you don't really want to go, then you send one of your, <laughs> one of your avatars, a couple of avatars, right? You send, send them into this meeting, you know, a thousand of them, you know. So I think Ajahn Brahm has always said, oh, it would be nice to have all this, you know, if you had a thousand me's, I could send them one to Indonesia, one to, <laughs> one to Korea, one to kind of KL, and kind of all over the place, it would make it so much easier. You know? But imagine having to control all these people, right? You can send them there in the middle. <laughs> So these are the, the direct knowledges, and the abhinyas. And direct knowledge is just one of the ways of translation. Abhinya really means something like just insight, knowledge. You know, that's really what it means. So direct is just the way that Bikibodi translates these things. Okay, that was the last question for today. We've been going for one hour already, just on the Q&A. Yeah. Is there any last questions people would like to ask before we call it a day? Yes, that's right there, yeah. Yes.
okay. Um, okay, so the, the question is, you know, it's hard to understand how people could, ordinary people could understand the sutras in the old days because they, they seem so, uh, they seem so complex, so many aspects of them, so many parts. Uh, is it possible that they were compiled in this way after, after the fact, after the Buddha spoke them out? And a lot of, you know, remember a lot of the suttas that are given to, to lay people in those days were quite simple suttas. So if somebody was new to Buddhism, they would teach often in a fairly simple way. And then later on, when they got more advanced, they would be given advanced teachings. Some of the suttas today were actually very advanced and very, there's one uh, called the, uh, uh, the teaching to another Pindaka, which is found in the uh, Ajamanikaya, which is a very profound sutta on non-self, etc. Some of them actually are very profound. Uh, uh, but anyway, to answer your question, is it the case that the suttas were compiled? And I think the answer is probably not so much. Uh, and the reason is because if you, again, if you do the comparative study, right, with the Agamas, between the Agamas and the Pali, and what still exists in the Tibetan tradition, and Sanskrit fragments and all of this thing, you actually find that the suttas are very similar. Uh, there is no very little feeling of them having been compiled, at least not after they split off. Uh, could they have been compiled before then? Um, I, I doubt it because the, the thing is that because they have been, uh, been kept so carefully over 2,300 years uh, after they split apart in different lineages, uh, it looks like the Sangha was very conservative. How could you keep something so well unless the Sangha was very conservative? They were very, very careful at keeping the suttas in exactly the same way. And that's why the Chinese version of the Agamas is still almost exactly like the Pali, at least in many instances. And that conservatism would have come from somewhere. And I think it would have come from the time of the Buddha himself. When the Buddha said, this is the teaching you should remember. These are the teachings you should recite together. These teachings which I have given you. This is what should be your teacher in the future. No need to elect anybody else to be the leader of the Sangha. The leader of the Sangha is the Dhamma and Vinaya that I have given you over my lifetime. It's very clear about that. So I think from the very beginning, the monastic community felt a very powerful responsibility of actually keeping these teachings intact in exactly the way they were. And that is why, even now, after two and a half thousand years, we see that similarity between the arguments and the uh, and the Pali Sutta. Sometimes the similarity is absolutely astonishing. Just like with the first Sutta I read up this morning, and when I read the Chinese, I could barely believe it because it's word for word almost exactly the same. It varies a little bit. Not all Suttas are like that, uh, but many, many are. All the core teachings are certainly like that. Uh. So um, I think maybe in some cases you're right, but generally speaking, I would say probably not. Probably not compiled after. Okay, so, anything else? Are you all exhausted? Are you, are you okay? So, okay, so maybe we should pay respect to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha before we leave. Let's do that together.